Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, John Nocklinger. I'm a men's divorce coach and a New Jersey divorce attorney and mediator. Today, we're going to discuss how to spot red flags and how to attract your perfect partner after divorce. My guest for this conversation is Stephanie McPhail. She is a toxic relationship recovery expert and a certified crisis counselor and coach. Stephanie holds a double master's degree in health and education. She helps people reinvent themselves, sometimes after divorce, so they can stop repeating old patterns, moving forward to be happy again. Thank you for being here today, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I was actually looking at your Instagram page before we started recording and watching all your videos, and I'm I'm addicted. I was like watching them like crazy. You guys have to go to her Instagram page. She she produces a lot of good videos with a lot of good little tidbits. I love it. You're, before, you're probably the first person to say that because my Instagram is like dead. My TikTok right now is like booming and um, Instagram, I always feel like I'm failing Instagram. Like I just don't post there as much and I don't have as much activity going on there. <laughs> well, what you have there is good. Like I love, I love looking at the reels. I mean, to some degree, TikTok and Instagram, you know, like the little videos can be very yeah. similar, but, yeah. um, I love, I loved it. But before we get into like, you know, really talking shop here about, um, you know, helping people find that perfect partner, uh, I would like to a little bit, know a little bit more about how did you get into doing this and what about your background led you to want to actually help people uh, find a good, a better relationship? Well, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to be on, especially with what your background is. Um, but I, I don't know about anyone who's listening, but I used to be really good at choosing really crappy partners and then trying everything possible to make it work. <laughs> and that's, you know, and I, I think that so... I had an upbringing. My parents didn't get along well. I um, learned that love was uncomfortable and you had to prove yourself and there was drama. Didn't realize that was kind of like my default. And so my first long-term relationship started out really great, then got really bad. And then instead of leaving, I stayed to try to make it work. Even though part of me knew that that was not the right person for me, I tried really hard to make it work. And there started to become some physical abuse, just not good things happening. I ended that relationship, thought I was smart. I had a degree in psychology. I was a certified crisis counselor already. I'm just never going to do that again. And then I ended up with my first husband who strangled me on our wedding night. And I still tried to stay and make it work because I was embarrassed, because I was ashamed, because I was getting older and I felt like this was the best it was going to get. And I did everything I could to research and find out what I was doing wrong to try to fix it and help him. and go through all of that until I finally stopped the dance, as I call it, because there's like the throw them out, let them back in, let's try to figure it out. There's all that drama that goes along with it. I stopped the dance and decided to end that relationship. And I still didn't get the right help right away because I still thought I could do it on my own until I went through a major depression after getting ghosted. And then it was like, okay, whatever I'm doing is obviously wrong. And I need help to figure this out. And that's when I created my team. I rediscovered myself. And then I ended up finding the man of my dreams. But it wasn't until I had to take that real big step back and look at my life and the commonality, which was me, and figure out what I was doing wrong so that I could stop it. And now I get to help other people heal. And I get to actually work with my husband in focusing on people heal and, and create their best lives after toxic relationships. And you had a background in psychology and you were still going through all this. I, I think that's interesting because I stayed in a bad marriage too, and I'm a divorce attorney. You would think people, you know, it's interesting that those of us that have some kind of training where you might, you would think we could like pinpoint or see things that are going on. The hardest person to see what's going on is yourself. Like it's so hard to, to like actually like look in the mirror and actually see what's going on. Well, and we I minimize it, right? Like everybody else has a problem, but I'm okay. I actually just did an interview with someone. She worked for the police department helping domestic violence victims. And her boyfriend was another police officer and would take a gun out, you know, 
swing it around and threaten her life. And she was still going back to work, helping the domestic violence victims, mm -hmm. pretending like everything was okay at home for her. It's a common theme that I see with clients, very successful, very professional people, very smart, but not so good when it comes to relationships. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with what the, the, the tools that we've learned. And that's why it's okay to ask for help. And one of the things that I really try to advocate on this podcast is just showing people who's out there that can help you and the types of help you can get because no one needs to live in misery. No one needs to live without love. No one needs to be miserable. And if you are those things, if you are miserable, you're not in love with the person you're with, there is a different road you can go down. And maybe you do need some help. I mean, that's that's really what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Yeah. So you, when you get people, Stephanie, do are they usually single and they're looking for a better relationship? Or do you get people that are in really bad relationships and they want to figure out how to get out? Like, where do you usually find people when they come to you? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> to <both. laughs> So it's interesting because I do share my story of abusive relationships. I think there's a lot of people that come to me while they're still trying to figure out, I call it the research mode, where they're still learning, they're researching, they're trying to figure out what's wrong. Like they can tell something is off. They, if they're being honest with themselves, they know some things are not good and they're trying to figure out what's what to do, like what the next steps are. So before they start the divorce process, before they decide to break up with a person, they will find me just to kind of start getting information. So we actually help people with like, I call it the withdrawals, the withdrawals from the toxic relationship, because that can be really what keeps us in for a really long time. Um, our favorite thing really to do is once the person has left, once the relationship has ended, to help them rebuild. And I say, and I love, I mean, I love both and I think we need help in both. The reason why the reinventing part is so fun is because you're starting from scratch and you're basically deciding, hey, I want this in my life. Hey, I don't want this in my life. I deserve this. You know, and I think when you're when you're so used to being in survival mode, we forget what it's like to be excited and happy and have this adventurous life. And we need to be reminded of that. So I, I love that, but I, I'm always very honored when somebody reaches out and says, hey, I think this is what's going on. Can you help me get out? And then to just be able to hold someone's hand and support them through that leaving process. And then we get to go do the fun start, the fun stuff of recreating after they leave the relationship. Yeah. Well, whenever you're talking to somebody who's in a toxic relationship, I think one of the things that many people don't, can't get their arms around is what is a toxic relationship? Because, you know, everyone sort of looks at it differently. I mean, there's some people that go to an extreme and think it's only toxic if you're being abused, like physically abused. Um, and obviously that's not the case, but I'm a little interested in what you believe or like generically speaking, what what is a toxic relationship or what are some of the things that someone should be looking for to determine that they're in a toxic relationship? Well, that's a great question. And I think that because the word narcissist gets thrown around so often, I'm not disputing that there's a lot of narcissism going on and there are narcissistic qualities that you know are existent in actually a lot of people. The, the thing that I always want people to think about is, if you are in a relationship where you feel drained, you don't feel heard, you don't feel supported, where when you are with them, you're not the best version of yourself, you're not inspired, you don't feel like you can speak openly to them, then there's a good chance you're in a toxic relationship. You, you bring up issues, they don't wanna talk about it, they don't wanna take responsibility, they don't wanna work on their end, You know, it feels like it's one-sided, all of those things would be examples of toxic relationships. I want you to think about how you feel when you're around them. Because what we do is as intelligent people, most of us start researching and we become experts in narcissists, in sociopaths, in psychopaths, in borderline personality, and all these other things. And although it's great to have that information, and again, I had a degree in psychology. I had that information. It didn't allow me to choose something different. So we have to figure out like, okay, great, get the information, but then you need to make sure that you are getting help to choose something different because there's a part of us that is trying to make something work that is not workable. 
So we've got to figure out what that is and really focus on ourselves because the more time we focus on what's wrong with the other person, we take that time away from focusing on ourselves and healing ourselves. So it's important to make sure that you're getting the help along with the information and pay attention to how you feel instead of becoming an expert in what's wrong with the other person. I absolutely love what you just said because putting on my divorce attorney hat for a moment, uh, doing that for 20 years, Stephanie, 70, 80% of everyone who's coming into my office, you know, if you're a man, I have to hear about how their wives are bipolar. And if they're a woman, I have to hear about their husbands are narcissists. Yep. If you were sat in my office, you would think literally everyone in the world is either bipolar or a narcissist because that's everyone puts those labels on everything. And I think you're absolutely right. Everyone focuses on putting the label on the other person rather than focusing in on how the, that are, that person's making them feel. Um, and, you know, because we don't all take care of ourselves. So I really think that's important. I'm so, I, I know narcissism is a, is a very, um, it's a, it's a thing that a lot of people deal with, but I'm really sick of everyone just throwing around these terms. I'm just sick of it. Um, it just, it doesn't help. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help no. you by pinpointing. The only thing it does help sometimes is just re recognizing just how serious of an issue that you're confronting. Uh, if someone else can, you know, see something that you're not seeing, because sometimes you know, as you know, sometimes if someone is truly a narcissist, it's very difficult for you to recognize it because some of them are just so good um, at, you know, making you believe whatever they want you to believe. Well, they're um, coverts. But, they're very good at pretending and manipulating. So, yeah. and that's where people, they want, you know, it's, I, I understand why they want to tell, because every lawyer I talk to is always like, everybody in the world is a narcissist at this point. And, you know, and yes, there are some people that are just jerks. Like they're just, <laughs> and there's also just some people that we just don't get along well with. I mean, and also all of those things happen. And if you're going through a divorce, you're not getting along, whether, no matter what it is, the, the, it's a good to be aware. And people will come to me and say, none of the lawyers know about narcissism. And I'm like, no, they all do. But the law doesn't differentiate like, well, this person's a narcissist. So we have to treat them differently through the divorce. It's good to be aware they have narcissistic qualities and some people actually are narcissists, but a lot of them more that there's a spectrum when it comes to narcissism. So there's a high number of people with narcissistic qualities, which means they're selfish, they're ego driven. It's all about them. There's no responsibility for themselves. So it's good to be aware that that's how they are. So it's going to be maybe more difficult to go through the process of getting a divorce, but it doesn't change the process. You still have to go through what the law says to get a divorce from someone. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about coming out of one of these bad relationships where there's children involved. Um, that's obviously something that a lot of people going through a divorce have to deal with. And it's hard enough, you know, excising yourself from a toxic relationship when it's just you, but add children into the mix and it's all that much harder. Um, how do you deal with that? I, I would say, well, you know, we still have to focus on ourselves and focus on how we are communicating. One of, I actually had um, a friend of mine give this example, and I think it's so on point. You can give your children a beautiful gift by teaching them how to deal with difficult people if you are ending a relationship with a narcissist or a toxic person. So as much as it hurts and it's uncomfortable to go through the process of divorce, and you know, a lot of people again will say, I just I don't want to, I don't want to put my kids through that. I'm worried about, you know, them choosing sides when they're older and all of that. You, you know, you have to think about if you don't make this decision to end this relationship, then you are teaching your kids that it's okay to be with someone who treats you badly, someone who makes you feel bad, someone who's not supportive and respectful and all of that. If you're going through this process and you can be a good listener to your kids. You can teach them about positive coping skills. You can keep your cool so that because the narcissist is going to want to like poke it, you know, poke at your buttons and try to get you to lose your temper, to say things. Again, it's a manipulation and control. So if you can show your kids that you can keep it together, you're not going to badmouth the spouse. You're going to talk to your kids about healthy communications and healthy boundaries. And if you can teach them those things, you're actually giving them a gift that they will continue to have 
for the rest of their lives. It stinks that it's going to be they're learning it about their parents, but it will help them because they're going to meet difficult people in whatever career they have. So if they learn healthy communication and healthy boundaries now, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to get themselves into that position later on with a partner. And they're going to know what to do and say if they deal with that with a work relationship or friend relationship, they're going to be able to speak up for themselves and advocate better. So as much as it feels awful, it can actually be a gift if we work on ourselves and heal and then teach what we learn to our children. Yeah, your kids are watching everything. They're watching everything. They're internalizing everything. Um, so people are coming out of relationship and we've been talking about toxic relationships, but you know, relationships end. How do you have help someone look at the relationship they just came out of and learn from what just happened so that they can make better choices next time. And, you know, how much, how much of this really, I mean, we've been talking about the other person being toxic, um, but I'm a firm believer that even if you're in a toxic, toxic relationship, there are things that you have to look at in yourself that you went through. How do you start the process of having putting that mirror up to someone's face and helping them actually take off, you know, whatever makeup mask, whatever they think they're wearing and really get down to the core of how did you get into this relationship in the first place? Because otherwise you're just going to re repeat yourself. You know, I always say that's the reason why second divorces have a higher rate. I mean, second marriages have a higher rate of divorce than first marriages because people just marry the same person again because they didn't learn the lessons from the first marriage. So I know it's a big question, but how do you go about just trying to get someone to see the part they played so that they can make better choices next time? So this is, to me, the most important thing is that we're smart people. So again, if it was just intelligence, we would just do differently next time. I didn't do differently next time. I mean, the, my first long-term relationship wasn't my husband, but we were together for seven and a half years and I married someone who was worse. So, you know, and I was, I'm never going to do that again. I'm just, I'm going to know the signs and I'm never going to do it again. The problem is, is that if you, if you try to stare at what you're avoiding, you're going to end up running exactly into that. Like if you're going to get into a car accident, don't stare at the telephone pole, look to where you want to go. But we don't do that in relationships. We go to what's automatic. So if our upbringing is love is stressful, anxiety, you got to fight for it, all those negative things without meaning to, our default is to find that in another relationship. So we have to heal that. The hardest thing for any of us is to admit that we're not perfect. We have things we need to work on too. And it's not until we admit that that we actually heal and stop the cycle because that's really where our magic comes in. We don't want you to waste another 10 years, 30 years with someone that's not the right fit for you. We want you to be able to stop being attracted to people who aren't good for you, you know, and also step up for you and to be able to, again, effectively communicate, share your wants and needs, feel like you have your own life and your own, you know, your own wants and needs and feel deserving and your self-esteem is good and all of that. So, we actually take people through a process when they come to us. They've already come to us. So we, either we've helped them through that relationship or they're on the other side. And now they're like, okay, I just don't want to do that again. I want to notice the red flags this time, not ignore them. I want to change my default for who I'm attracted to. We actually take them through different steps. So the first one is, is to identify where we are repeating patterns, identify how we got here. Is it old childhood patterns? Is it, you know, self-esteem? Is it past relationships? What what is it that got you to this place? It's normally a few different things. You know, if our I have clients that come to me and they're like, oh, I had a great upbringing. My parents were wonderful. And then you start going through the things and you're like, well, these are some of the holes. It doesn't mean they had terrible parents, but these were some of the holes that they had. You have other people that come to us and like you cry listening to their stories because they're terrible. You're like, no wonder why. You don't have any of the information you need to create a healthy relationship. And then there's the reiteration of all of those toxic relationships that are just being repeated over and over and over again. So the first most important step is to identify. The second one is to build a team. You want to make sure that you have experts on your team to help you make different decisions. Because if you are 
you know, when you get stuck in a rut, you keep going back to the same place without meaning to. You need someone to help you get out of your comfort zone and get out of your own thinking because we can't read the label from inside the bottle. We need somebody else to help us see where our faults are, where we're making the same mistakes so that we can choose differently. That also means having healthy people that we're friends with, healthy people to go to the gym with, like really changing our whole support system so that they're more positive and more inclined to help us through whatever life is gonna bring us because there's always gonna be something. Number three is we wanna discover who we are. Who are we without a relationship? The biggest problem we have is that many of us go right from one relationship to another one. Because I knew after my first long-term relationship, I was never gonna do that again, but I didn't do the healing. So I jumped right into another relationship. I didn't take enough time to figure out who I was, what I wanted, and what I wanted in a partner. So I didn't know any of those, those things. So we've got to increase our self-esteem. We've got to start getting to know who we are. What's our passion? What's our purpose? Really, really focus on ourselves. It's not selfish. Focus on who we are, what we want without a partner so that we are better inclined to support our own best interests and only allow people that are there to help and support us. So really important to go through that. Um, understanding self. What are the limiting beliefs that we have about relationships? I can't tell you, and you work with men, how many women are like, there's no good men out there. They're all screwed up. None of them are getting help. And men are like, there's no good women out there. None of them are getting help. And I'm like, I work with both men and women, you know, and I, they are getting help. Not everybody, you know, more people should be getting support, but there are people that are working on themselves and trying to make it better. If we're, if we're only seeing yellow cars, cause we have only driven yellow cars, maybe it's time to start looking for something else. You know, you pay attention to what you know, to what you've seen. So you just keep reiterating that false belief that there's no good people out there. So we've got to look at those limiting beliefs that we have for ourselves. And then pursue, like connect to your gut, connect to your intuition, start trusting yourself again. Because when you've been in these toxic relationships, we lose trust in ourselves. We have to start saying like, hey, that's a red flag. I deserve more than that. I'm going to walk away from that relationship. There's something better for me that's going to be a better fit. So that's another part. And then goal setting. Your, your point to your life should not be a toxic relationship and trying to figure out how to deal with it. It should be going back and going for another career, going to travel through Europe. You know, uh, my thing was I had always wanted to like travel through the United States. I jumped in my car. I had a, a cool Jeep, jumped in my Jeep. I traveled from New York all the way to Montana just to do it because that was a goal that I had. So, you know, to start looking at the goal shouldn't be like, I just want to be in a relationship. The goal should be happiness, should be feeling content, should be feeling good, filling up your own cup. And then you're going to start attracting healthier people once you do that. But the goal isn't, I got to be in a relationship where I'm not good enough. The people who are needy attract takers. And the takers are the narcissists and the people who are unhealthy. If you're a giver and you're needy, that's the perfect example or perfect recipe for a narcissist to come around and come save the day, come swoop you up and take care of you and for you to fall right into it because you haven't healed the parts of yourself that were attracted to someone who was ready to take advantage of you because you were needy and, I mean, I hate to say even desperate to find someone to be in a relationship with because it felt uncomfortable and felt like you weren't good enough to be single. So you were just talking about one of the things that someone needs to figure out is who needs to be on their team to help them sort of get through this. And I think for a lot of people, that's one of the hardest things to hear because, you know, you, you go off on the internet, you listen to podcasts, you're, you're watching videos, and there seems to be a million people, Stephanie, that, uh, that are out there to help you with all kinds of different things. And, you know, anyone listening to you knows that you know what you're you know what you're talking about and you're very good at what you do. I'm kind of curious, aside from somebody helping you, you know, navigate your way out of a toxic relationship, you know, doing all these things you were just talking about so that you can move forward into a new relationship with your eyes, hopefully a lot more open. Who are some of the other types of people that you think people need on their team? Like, for example, I think most, the average person thinks, okay, if I'm struggling, I need to get a therapist. 
I mean, that's sort of like the baseline, right? Like talk therapy. Um, and I think the reason that people don't always get the help they need is they just don't know who, you know, you don't know what you don't know. They don't know who they should even go yeah. get on their team. So talk to our listeners a little bit about how you figure out who needs to be on your team and what kind of help you need. Well, and I, I love that question. And I think, I mean, you and I as coaches, I think what's really important for everyone to differentiate is there's a time and a place for a therapist. I love therapists. They're great. That was the beginning of, of me figuring myself out, understanding like, oh my gosh, I'm in a, a physically abusive relationship. I am in a verbally abusive relationship. I needed someone to point that out to me. And that was my therapist. The issue with therapy is that therapy is about figuring out going backwards. Like where, how did I get here? So that, that's a good time for that. But then when you're trying to create something different and you need someone to point out where you're making mistakes and you need the hand holding to actually help you achieve a new goal, that's where people like you and I come in. That's where the coaching comes in because I'm not afraid to say, Hey, don't do that. <laughs> Try this instead. You know, I can look at like, Oh, I see what you're doing there. That's insecurity. Let's do this instead. You know? So, but I think that in, in saying that too, is you have to really look at who you vibe with because I, I might not be everybody's cup of tea and that's okay. Find someone who is. I come from a very holistic perspective. I don't think we heal by just talking about things. I want to look at my, you know, my background is health education along with psychology and my background in helping people heal. So how much exercise are you getting? Because we know that after, you know, these relationships, we're stressed, we're overwhelmed, we have inflammation going on, our bodies aren't working as well. I want to get you making sure that you're taking care of yourself again because you've been taking care of everybody else except for yourself. So are you getting your seven to eight hours of sleep every night? Are you drinking your 96 ounces of water? Are you meditating every day to reconnect to your spiritual side? Are you getting out there and meeting new people to add to people that are on your team of positive people who inspire and support you? So that, you know, that's part of it. Are you getting your exercise? Because endorphins get increased when you are exercised, which means if you've been in a depression or things have been starting to feel kind of down, you want to make sure that you're moving your body for 30 minutes to increase your endorphins. So you want to find someone who's really at that level of what you're looking for if you're looking for paid support. Now, who else do we need? I had to go through a reality check that a lot of my friends were pretty toxic. They were also in bad relationships. So if I was going to listen to them to complain about their significant others, in my mind, well, what I'm dealing with might not be so bad. Or what kind of advice are they going to give me? Because they're no better off than I am. So I had to kind of step away from those people, which felt isolating, but it allowed me to branch out and make new friends, connect to the people who were there to really support me and inspire me, and also branch out to new people by going out and trying the Reiki practitioner class that was out there, or the new art class, or go hiking, or all of those things, put myself out there to meet new people, to add to my team of people that were in my support network. Sometimes family, sometimes we have to take a little break from family because some of them might not be so, so supportive of us. They might've been our original toxic relationship. Sometimes some people in the family we need to reconnect to. So, you know, all of those people, if you're, if you're exercising, getting someone who's a personal trainer, you know, that was something that I got that was really important is having a trainer to just get me to exercise regularly, to do the right exercises and keep me going and, and, and you know, inspire me when I didn't really feel like, like being there. So you really want to look at, when I always say, again, we're holistic, so you want to look at the whole picture. So what are the areas of your health, your life that you need support with? Think about your physical health, your emotional health, me emotional mental health, right? your spiritual health and your social health. I don't know if I went through two or one did one twice, but you have to look at those different areas, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and social. All of those things are equally important. But when we've been in a toxic relationship, it's been all give and we've lost the balance in those other areas. So any, any supports that you can get to help you in there to rebalance you is what you wanna focus on when you're healing. I think it was so important to to really emphasize that your friends 
could be toxic. I don't, I think what's difficult for us all, we're, we're talking about like a romantic relationship that could be toxic and yet you could just surround yourself with toxic people everywhere. Your mother and father could be toxic. Your brother could be toxic. Your best friend could be toxic. And you know, you have to surround yourself with people that are gonna lift you up. It's, it's kind of a corollary. It's like, if you wanna make more money, you don't hang out with people that make less money than you. You make, yes. you, you, you go to people that are more successful that are where you want to go. So it, it's very, I know it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. You have to make sure you're surrounding yourself with people that are going to uh, lift you up and move you forward. So now I heard you talk about red flags a lot. How do you identify red flags when you're in a relationship? Because I think that's got to be the hardest thing to help someone understand that there's even, you know, that there are red flags that they're just not seeing. How do you open up their eyes so they can see these red flags? I think, I think most of us see them. We just ignore them because it's what we know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always talk about, so in my book, Being Loved Shin Hurt, I think for many of us, our default of relationships, we don't even realize that the default is stress and overwhelm. So when we think about love, for many of us, we think of the butterflies and the excitement and the, the proving yourself <laughs> for each other. If you watch any of the, the Hollywood movies, you listen to, to songs, it's stressful to be in a relationship, <laughs> it seems. But if that's what we think it is, we find that and we're like, oh, I'm in love. I need to make it work. I need to figure this out. You have this physical attraction those kinds of things are, are, are there. That's, and it sounds so beautiful, but love is so much more than that. And as you start to heal, you realize love should actually be calm. I mean, when I, when I met, and that was for me was the biggest turning point was literally, you know, I'll share a little story. I was at a concert. I'm a big fish fan. I don't know if you know the band, but I, I love this band called fish. And I was at a, at a concert with my friends who had been together since they were 16 years old. And I remember, and this was pretty, I don't know, a few months after I'd gotten a divorce. And I remember being at this concert with them. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, I, I think I get it. And my friend looks at me like, what? What are you talking about? Like randomly saying you get it in the middle of this concert. And I said, I think I finally figured out what love is. And she had this like empathetic, really big smile on her face. And she says, what is it? And I said, it's, it's calm. I said, I'm hanging out with you and I'm not worried that one of you is gonna start fighting with the other one, that we're gonna have, that a big tirade is going on, that I, I, I felt safe. And I hadn't felt that in such a long time. I always, with my ex-partner, was worried when he was gonna lose his temper, when I was gonna say the wrong thing, when there was gonna be a big knock him out, blow him out argument, or he would say mean and horrible things to me under his breath when nobody else was listening and I was going to suddenly be sad and upset and overwhelmed because he was in a bad mood because of something I did or something that happened in the world that I had nothing to do with. I never felt safe. And it was in that exact moment that I realized how love should be and that it should feel safe. So being loved shouldn't hurt. Literally that's the name of my book came out of that moment when I realized it was a calmness. So when you talk about red flags, if, if you're always used to being with someone, if you're like, I had to fight for the relationship, I had to prove myself, I had to change who I was, I feel stressed and overwhelmed when I'm around them, there's drama that's associated with it. You know, all of those things, that's not love. Those are red flags. The green flags are things, <clears throat> excuse me, where you feel safe, you feel good, you feel inspired, you feel better. Uh, than your regular self when you're around them. Those are the green flags. Some of the ones that I write about in my book are some of the simple ones, like being afraid to be in the car with them because they lose their temper and they start driving erratically. How are they with animals? How do they talk about their exes? How do they talk about their family? Do they have any friends? Do they have their own stuff to do? Are they, how are things when you don't get along, you know, or when you don't agree? How do you deal with those things? How is communication? All of those things happen way before we make a decision to commit to this person, but they happen and it's always like that frog in the boiling pot. They happen slowly over time. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? Because we were like, oh, 
he called me a, I won't say, cause I don't know what's allowed on your podcast. He called me whatever name and I let it go because you know, he was in a bad mood or he drove crazy, but he said that it's cause he was stressed about work and I let it go. And then all of a sudden you're, you're at this other place where he, like my ex would get mad and drop me off on the side of the road. How did I get here? He had done all those other things and already showed me, but I ignored all those red flags because I was hoping that it would get better and, and things. And again, that kind of stress and overwhelm was normal for me because that's what love was. So again, I think part of it is red flags are important to know, but when you've done the healing work, you will feel those feelings. And instead of being pulled in, cause that's what happens, because you know it's again what you know instead of being pulled in you're totally turned off you're like oh god you would curse at me i'm not putting up with someone like that you would speak to someone like like you know you would speak to someone like that i'm not going to be around someone who speaks to me that way and my current husband david he says like i could never imagine calling you names well, i'm like because well, number one you wouldn't but number two if you did you know that i wouldn't put up with it but in my first marriage I would say, don't call me that name. And the first na time he got mad at me, those were the first two names he would call me. So, and then it was just like, but you know, I, let me explain it to him again. Let me try to, you shouldn't have to explain to someone not to curse and scream at you. That should be obvious, you know, <laughs> but, but this version of me would never even allow that. I would never allow it to get to that. And if it did, even we're nine years married, I wouldn't be putting up with that at all. So yeah, I think you have to change your default before so that you, you see those red flags and they're a turn off instead of a, let's try to fix it and make it work. Sure. Well, Stephanie, this podcast is not for children, so you can say whatever you want okay, to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so you're talking about doing the healing work. And I guess I'm curious, like, how do you know that you've actually done, you've done the work that you need to do to be in another relationship like what does do you, does the light just go off feel like okay i understand things now i understand my eyes are open now you know i finally got a pair of glasses where i can see everything and i can see where i'm going like how do you know that you've done enough of this work so that you can move on and have a really good relationship so and that's that's a really great question and i have you know once people do the the reinventing themselves and recreating their lives we will often help them start the dating process and so i call the the time after you've created your like amazing wonderful life because that's what we want to focus on i call that the um, educational dating phase so i don't think first of all i don't think that we're ever 100 percent healed i think sometimes there are triggers that remind us some of the areas we need to work on. And I think those are very important because again, we're human beings and it's okay for, for things are not always gonna be perfect. But when we're educationally dating, we are going out there to see who's going to be a good fit for us. I think most of the time when we go out into the dating world, we're trying to prove ourselves to somebody else. Like, ooh, this person seems like they look good on this dating app, for example. I hope they like me when I meet them. Instead of thinking that way, we want to go on this date and say, huh, this will be fun. Let's see if this person's a good fit. And if not, it's going to be a funny story. It's going to be something to talk about with my friends. It's, it's supposed to be fun and easy. So when you do meet them, you're just getting to know someone. You're getting to, you know, chat, go back and forth, get to know them and see if they're a good fit for you. Is this someone that I could see as a good partner for me, as opposed to let me do and say whatever I need for them to choose me? Because that's not gonna work. You also don't get to know someone well if you're trying to prove how worthy you are to that other person. So you've got to come from a place of, I am worthy whether or not you think that I am. So I think that's a really important piece. And of course, as you're dating for educational purposes, you're also figuring out, you know, is, is education important? What values are important? What things do I really want in a relationship? When I was first dating, I was like, I really want someone who is a professional that does X, Y, Z. And I started meeting those people and I was like, oh my gosh, these people work like 16 hours a day. I don't want to be in a relationship with someone like that. So I kind of changed who I was looking for. So I got to learn exactly what I wanted. So that's one big important thing. But the other thing is, is 
dealing with situations in a more positive way. So instead of, hey, I went on a date, for example, and it didn't work out. And now for the next month, I'm depressed in bed because they didn't choose me. We're able to like, react differently where we say, Oh, that was a good learning experience. I learned more of what I want or what I don't want in a relationship. It's not about me. It's about this person. We just weren't a good fit for each other. I can move on. So we don't get stuck in this negative place. We're able to come back more quickly and not make, not feel like we're not good enough or that there's something wrong with us because a relationship didn't work and to be able to walk away when things don't, are not working right. I just had a client recently, where she started dating some guy. He was telling her all the right things. My husband and I both said, we, <laughs> we see right through this. This is not a good person for you. She was like, let me try it out. She did anyway. He was not the right person for her. And instead of her trying to continue to force that relationship to work, she ended it, even though it hurts, she ended the relationship. And then she was able to give herself a day of like, oh, that didn't really feel great for that relationship to end. And let me process what's ha what happened. She processed it and then bam, she's moving on to the next you know possibility. She didn't stay stuck there. And that's really what we need is that reaction. Feel your feelings, don't live there, learn from it and then move on so that you can actually go and find what you're looking for. Yeah, and I really like how you, I've, I've heard you talk on videos, the, the aforementioned videos that I was watching before we started today. I like how you talk about attracting the perfect partner as opposed to going and finding the perfect partner. Because I do think they're different things. Like you you talked a little bit about, you know, going out and trying to find somebody and then, you know, someone gets upset that that person, you know, ghosts them or doesn't want to talk, you know, that isn't interested in a relationship. But clearly you didn't attract the perfect partner if that's what you're experiencing. Yeah. How do you get someone to see the difference between, you know, just attracting the right people into your orbit as opposed to you going and trying to force it, you trying to go out there and, you know, find somebody. Um, because I mean, I, I'm a big believer that the universe sort of works in ways that we don't really understand. And if you put the energy out in the world, you're going to find the right, per you're the right person's going to enter your life. They just yeah. are. Um, how do you how do you get someone to understand the difference? Because what we're all, this is the dating site, dating app world we're living in right now. The swiping, oh, I like them, I like them, I don't like them, I, and and so we're we're like matching based on things like that. How do you get someone to understand that this really is about attracting the right people into your life? Be really genuinely you. I think that's the biggest, most important thing. I tell clients all the time, let your weirdo flag fly. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our own things, right? And so often we, we try to fit in somebody else's mold. That's someone who's insecure, who doesn't feel good about themselves. That's what we've done. And that's what got us into the bad relationship to begin with. If you're not being real, how can the people that like the real you find you? And that to me, I think is such an important thing. We're like, let me be, let me play small. Let me, I don't want to be too much. I don't want to overwhelm people with me. But how about instead of, hey, I'm going to be me. And if you don't like it, go after yourself. Like, that's fine. It's nothing against you and me. This is just, I'm going to be me. And this is who, you know, this is who I am. I think that's such an important thing. And I, you know, I say all the time, when I met my husband, I was really at a place of like, I literally don't even care if I get into another relationship again. I even said to him, I'm dating someone else. If you don't like it, then move on because I, I don't even know if I'm going to be in a serious relationship. If I am, then they're going to have to be pretty amazing to get me to stop dating because I'm just having fun and I'm being me. I mean, I was so like real with my now husband. And of course he was like, well, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you know, this is what I'm looking for in someone. And I, I just was so genuinely me and not afraid of being single for the rest of my life. I wasn't afraid that I wasn't not, you know, not good enough. I wasn't afraid that people wouldn't like me. I was just me and that's who I was. And people just started coming out of the woodwork of people being interested. And there was the more me I was, the more people that actually were higher caliber started actually showing up where before I kept attracting toxic people, but I wasn't being genuinely myself. 
So of course I wasn't finding the right people. The more me I was, I was like, why didn't I meet these people 20 years ago? My whole life would have been totally different, but I wasn't there. I didn't feel that confidence in me. And so, you know, my, my husband, then I'm like, I don't think I would have even been interested in you had I not been through my process and gotten comfortable with myself and all of that. And then, you know, I was joking around, like I went to his apartment for the first time I walked in and he had all the same like self-help books as I did. And I was like, oh, swoon. <laughs> I really did find someone who likes all the same things as me. This is so cool. It's not just pretend or, you know, whatever. And I think that that's, but again, I had to be real and be honest with who I was and not, not shy away from the weird stuff that was, that was me. And that's what makes us who we are. Yeah. And I think that applies to all areas of your life. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It's a little bit different, but I know at, like as a, as a men's divorce coach and an attorney, once I started this podcast and I started doing videos where I just decided to, you know, basically figuratively and literally take the tie and the suit off and just be myself, the, the, the number of people that entered my life, both as clients and other professionals that were more in tune with the, with who I was, was astronomical. And, right. you know, post-divorce, same thing. After I learned how to be myself again, I attracted the exact right person. You know, I, I, I've i told this story in this podcast before, but I mean, I met my spouse in an airport on the way to a funeral, like just passing by in a United club. I mean, it's the most just, you know, ships passing in the night, just, but it was just like, at that point I was ready. And, you know, people, I think the thing to take away, the thing I'm going to take away from our conversation is you have to do the work when you come out of one of these relationships. What that work looks like is gonna be different for every person, but you have to do the work. And if you don't do the work, you should not expect a different result the next time. You just shouldn't. And if the next result's the same as the first one, you only have yourself to blame. And there are people like Stephanie out there that can help you. They can help you figure out what went wrong, what went right, but take all of that and put you in a position to do great things with your life. Cause we only live once. No one should be miserable. Everyone deserves love. Everyone deserves a great relationship, but you got to find the right, you have to attract the right person. You have to attract the right person in your life and you can do it. Everybody can. There's no, if you're out there saying, Oh, they're just, you know, there's no way I'm, there's just no way I, I only attract, you know, jerks and assholes and all this other crap. Yeah, that's a mindset limitation that you have. Everyone can attract the right person. Every There's someone out there for everybody that's gonna be your person, your right person. And I think Stephanie would be a great person to add to your team um, when you're coming out of a relation a relationship, whether it's toxic or not. I don't even think that that's terribly important because even if it's not toxic, it didn't work. There's a reason it didn't work. Figure out what it is so that you can have a better relationship next time. So Stephanie, if someone would like to work with you, how would they contact you? What kind of, you know, what kind of help do you offer people? Tell us a little bit about, you know, the people that are listening and they clearly are going to be like, Stephanie, I would love to talk to you more. How would they yeah, contact you? And, and, well, and I love what you said, and I'm going to just add to what you just said yep. is, I would have never believed 15 years ago that I would be helping people heal from toxic relationships. I would have, if someone said that to me, I would have been like, yeah, right. I am terrible at relationships. So I understand the people that are like, this is just my lot. This is just the way it is. I'm, if I can do it, you can too. I'm not special. I'm not a guru. It's just, I learned and I, I listened to the universe telling me what I needed to do. I, I got the support, did the work. And now I'm literally passionate about helping other people because I remember all too well what it felt like to be in it. I remember the feeling lost and all of that. So if you're thinking like, I don't think it's possible. This is just how my life is. I was there, but now I get to be married to my best friend and we get to help people heal. So Anything is possible for anyone. You just have to decide. I'm right now deciding to do something different. So with that being said, if you go to beingloved shouldn't hurt.com slash links, 
that's actually going to take you to my links page, which is going to offer you access to my private Facebook group, um, Toxic Love Transformation. It's going to bring you to my podcast, Toxic Love Transformation. It's going to also give you a free download. So I talked earlier about those steps of what you need to do to start healing. It's going to give you the first two steps to start you in the process because a lot of times we're stuck. So I want to give you the things to start you moving so that you're going in the right direction. And then we do offer group coaching and we do offer individual coaching. My husband, David, actually does something really cool called Psych K. It helps with the subconscious mindset about, is it possible for me to heal? Can I? Am I too old? Am I too messed up? Like all those things we tell ourselves. David's an expert at helping with that part. I'm really good at looking at what where we are creating the same patterns and what we can do to get out of them to choose something different. So go ahead, grab the free downloads, you know, join my podcast as well if this you know sounds of interest to you, um, and get the support. You know, get start getting the work, start focusing on you because if it's again, if it's possible for me, it's possible for you. Well, I'm gonna be putting your podcast on my download list because I gotta hear, I have to hear more about this and all of the links that Stephanie just um, was just talking about are gonna be in the show notes. So. You know, you don't have to take out a pen and pencil and go back and try to write them all down. Just go below and click it and you'll get to all those resources. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this is a conversation more people need to hear. And um, I know you would be a great resource for many of our listeners. Thank you.